Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and this is the official preview of the brand new Canon EOS R system. We've got a new body, we got a bunch of new lenses, and I wanna let you know that we are currently at a press event in Hawaii, Maui to be exact, where Canon just gave us a press briefing. Now they did something a little different than normal. Normally we get a press briefing a few days before the event so that we can have a video prepped with all of the specs. We didn't get to do that for this global launch. That's why it's midnight right now while we're filming this. Another couple of hours, Steven's gonna edit and we're gonna get this out to you right away. But let's go over the specs right now. And I will tell you I have a cold, so just understand I have a cold. Let's look at this. We have a new mount. The last time they changed the mount was 31 years ago in 1987. That larger mount of 54 millimeters allowed Canon to create lenses that were up to f1.2. Twos. So they're continuing with that, but this is the RF mount. We have a 30.3 megapixel CMOS sensor. It does have a low pass filter. So if you're wondering, did they take it out? No, it is still in this camera. There's a Digic 8 processor, which is one of the newer processors that Canon has. You can shoot eight frames a second, continuous. The only issue there is that's in one shot that is not in continuous full AF. In continuous full AF, you are getting five frames a second. Kind of odd that it's dumbed down that far, but just keep in mind, if you wanna shoot continuous, you're going to get five frames a second, but you'll get that for up to 47 raw files in a row, and it will save to get this a UHS-2 SD card slot. That means there's one SD card slot. Just like two weeks ago when we talked about the Nikon, I'm not happy with one card slot in any camera, whether you specify that it's a pro level camera or not. I don't care. I wanna have redundancy for my photos. We all know that video doesn't shoot redundant in most cameras other than what Sony offers, a couple that allow you to do that. But in this case, it's one card. I hate that fact. I harped on it heavily with the Nikon. I'm gonna harp on it heavily with the Canon but we've already been down this road, so let's go ahead and move on. They're saying it has 5,655 autofocus points. Now, when I picked it up and I looked through the camera, I didn't see 5,655 autofocusing points. It looked the same as it always looks. So is this a marketing ploy to say that it has a ton of autofocusing points? Because if it says that it has that many, I wanna go in there and individually select those points. Can I make the points bigger? Can I make them smaller? Which is what Fuji offers in the X-H1, which is a really great feature because if you wanna get more fine tuned, then you can do that. You know, it's funny because the Nikon has the pinpoint AF, that like pinpoint, it's really small. I didn't see that with the Canon, but again, we only had a couple of minutes with a hands-on to take a quick look. We'll actually get the camera in the next couple of days to play with, and we'll get you the full preview at that point. But it also won't be a full review just yet. In terms of autofocus, it's using dual pixel AF, and I will tell you that Canon says that this is the fastest autofocus in the world. It did seem really fast. Like, I'm not talking like snappy fast, I'm talking super fast with autofocus. Like, you didn't even notice that it was focusing. And we were in a really crappy low light situation that Canon called a test environment. And yeah, I'll just say that the lighting wasn't any good. If I had to tell you which was better, Nikon or Canon, and we heard that the Nikon wasn't as good in terms of lighting, yeah, the Nikon was better than the Canon one. Sorry, Canon, don't shoot me for saying that but it's absolutely true. Now, in terms of low light autofocus, it focuses down to EV negative six. Now, people made a big deal out of this, but keep in mind that it's with the 50 millimeter 1.2 at 1.2 with like single focus point. You gotta understand, it's not gonna be negative six EV in all situations, but that's pretty amazing that it does do that. That is a huge amount. Now, we know this is a mirrorless camera, which means you can shoot silent kinda in this camera. In one shot, every time you press the button, it's gonna be silent. That means you have to keep pressing the button. That also means there's no continuous shooting in silent at launch. Now they say there's gonna be a free firmware a month or two after the fact, but the fact that it's not launching with the ability to shoot continuous shooting silent, is pretty bad. Not a good sign right there at launch not to have that major feature in your camera. Now people ask about, does it have IAF? It does, it has pupil detect one shot. 
So again, with one shot, you're going to have pupil detect, but with a firmware upgrade, it's going to allow it to do continuous, but not at launch. But it also doesn't do that in video, which the Sonys don't do either. Now there's a 3.69 million dot EVF with 100% coverage. Now looking through this EVF in the low light situation we were in, I honestly couldn't tell you whether I was looking through an optical viewfinder or an electronic viewfinder. It looked really good. Now on the back of the camera, there's a 3.15 inch screen instead of a 3.2 inch screen, but it's 2.1 million dots and it's a very angle screen, which means it can flip out, it can rotate. This could be the perfect vlogging camera. It's probably not going to be, honestly, and we'll talk about that when we get to the video in just a second. But hey, it's got a flippy out rotatable screen. Good job there. But it does offer you the ability to change the focusing points by just using your thumb on the LCD screen while it's up to your eye. That is a nice feature to have. Now something new they added to this camera is called the multi-function bar, which helps you make selections. Say for example, you're shooting video and you want to quickly change the ISO just by swiping your finger across this touch sensitive bar. You could do that. You could change your white balance quickly. You could change it for doing your normal shooting settings. Now, I haven't really checked out what we can do with it fully, but it's something that's interesting. I'm not sure how it's gonna fully work out until I get my hands into the menu system to see all of the functions that it can do. Now, a major question is, can you get a grip for it? Yes, you can get a grip for it. And it has a shutter button on it, unlike what Nikon is doing. Don't ask me why. Now, for all of you people who already have a ton of EF lenses or EFS lenses, you'll be happy to find that there are three new adapters. The regular adapter is gonna be 99 bucks and allow you to take your EF lenses and EFS lenses and mount them onto this camera seamlessly without any loss of functionality. The second adapter adds a function ring which allows you to change shutter speed, aperture, ISO, a couple of other things at the lens level. So that's something you haven't had before. That's gonna be really good for video if you wanna make quick changes like that. And then the last one allows you to put in drop-in filters, like ND filters or circular polarizers, meaning you can now drop a filter behind any lens and add the ability for variable ND because it's got this little wheel thing that you can move, which is good, and also a circular polarizer. Now let's flip over my paper and get to video specs. You have 4K at 30 frames a second, 1080 at 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second at 720. Now, you would expect that to be much better now, but also to add insult to injury, the 4K is cropped. So, it's not full frame 4K video. Any lens that you put on the front of it, it's not gonna be wide angle anymore. You gotta multiply it by 1.7, which means if you wanted to shoot vloggy McVloggersons in 4K, good luck trying to look at yourself like this and get a wide angle lens that doesn't weigh 18 pounds on the front of this camera. They crippled this camera right off the rip by not allowing you to do full frame 4K. But it does have C-Log, which was a $100 add-on in the 5D Mark IV that's included here, and it has a clean 10-bit 422-4K, which is a very nice feature to have. As always, it's $29.59 with recording, headphone jack, microphone input jack, the normal stuff that you would have, including dual pixel AF, which is still awesome, and they also added focus peaking. Now we did a quick test with the face detect AF and as we suspected it did really well even in the lower light situations wide open. So that's a nice feature to have. Of course Canon has always done a great job with that. So if you're looking for that the face detect is really good. Now something new that they added that mostly no other camera has is that when you turn the camera off you take the lens off guess what happens to the shutter? It comes down protecting the sensor. But on the other hand, if you drop something inside and screw up the shutter, your camera's still useless anyway, but it should hopefully cut down on the amount of dust that ends up inside this camera. In terms of the body, it feels really nice in the hands. It doesn't feel like a small mirrorless camera. It feels substantial, but with a very nice grip. It's got the weather sealing. It's got the magnesium alloy. It feels like it is built very well. The on-off switch didn't make much sense to me. They have a new dial up top that's on-off that you figured they could have put better functions with and just left a regular switch on and off like the Canons have. I don't know why they put a dedicated on-off wheel 
It just seems like a waste of space. They could have done something better in that situation. Now, it does not have a joystick and it does not have IBIS inside of this body. You're still relying on IS. There are four new lenses. I think the lens lineup right off the rip is better than what Nikon came out with, though Canon didn't give us a full roadmap. They really didn't give us a roadmap. They just talked about these new lenses. You have the 35 1.8 IS. You have a 50 F 1.2 L. There's a 24 to 105 F 4 IS. And now there is a 28 to 70 F 2. That is a massive lens that is chody and heavy. I got to play with it. It's going to be pretty darn sweet at F2, but it's going to be $2,999, which is pretty expensive. But what Canon has added, they added a third ring. You don't just have zooming. You don't just have manual focus control. They added a third ring. So no longer is it one ring to rule them all. That third ring gives you other functionality that could come in handy, like changing shutter speed, aperture, ISO, things that you may need to get to quickly. This lens is gonna allow you to do that with that third ring that's around it. Now, like I just said, I, I think that they did a better job coming out with faster glass right off the rip. Nikon made a big deal out of how wide their mount is and how they can let so much light in, but failed to release quality lenses right off the forefront. Nikon's not going to be happy I said that, but I still hold true. This is a there's a 28 to 70 f2 zoom lens. That's pretty amazing. Now let's talk about some of the prices. The body, it's going to be $2,299 available in October. The 50 f1.2 is going to be $2,299. So at $2,299, it's more expensive than the Nikon Z6 but it's less expensive than the Z7. Now, with that being said, where does this fall into the Canon lineup? It's not a 6D Mark II. I believe that it's higher than that, but lower than a 5D Mark IV. Canon alluded to the fact that there's probably gonna be two new cameras coming at some point. If I had to guess, in the next six, eight, 12 months, less than 12 months, you're gonna see two other cameras, probably a 5D Mark IV style and probably a 1DX Mark II style camera for the sports shooters. Now, one thing that I found strange is that Canon spent a lot of time saying that this isn't the camera that you just buy and get a new system. It's it's an add-on to the system that you already have, which is kind of weird to say because you're not going to have like a 5D Mark IV or a 6D Mark II and then be like, you know, it's going to be nice to have one of these cameras, this EOS R in my bag, and then decide to use it. No, I found that to be odd. I don't know why they said that. To me, you're going to buy this body or you're going to buy the 6D Mark II. It just doesn't seem to make sense why they would hammer home that fact. Now we have to talk about Sony here. Now that we've seen Nikon's new mirrorless and Canon's new mirrorless, the saving graces for Nikon and Canon is the fact they have hundreds of millions of lenses out there in the world that are ready to adapt natively, seamlessly to these bodies. Sony has a jump start. They're on the third, fourth iterations of their bodies and they're eating the lunch of Nikon and Canon now that we see what they do. They don't cripple their cameras right off the rip. The A7 Mark III, the A7 R3, and the A9 share similar video features. Even the Sony A7 III has better video features than its two bigger siblings. The fact that Sony does that and they get that right is the reasons why a lot of people who are starting out today looking for a new system jump into Sony. But like I said, people that have the old system, they're gonna stick with it because they have the lenses. There's really no reason to jump ship, in my opinion, if you are heavily invested in the lenses. I do suspect that Canon and Nikon, they'll get it more right as new bodies come out, but they have catching up to do, especially this Canon launching with not the ability to even shoot continuous, continuous silent. Doesn't make much sense to me. So I'm gonna leave it right there. It's late, we wanna get this video to you. Thank you very much for watching and understanding that I have a cold. We're in Hawaii. We're going to get a hands-on where we can shoot with the camera for many hours tomorrow for most of the day, and we'll try to get you a preview video. But that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think down below. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.